This meeting will please come to order. Um, a couple of things that are, that are somewhat different. Um, even though we're going to ask that everybody be masked and require that because we're in a school, um, if you're speaking at any of the microphones and would prefer to lower your mask during that time, please do. Um, I think we'll, we'll go ahead and do that in the interest of clarity so we can understand what people are saying. I think our last annual town meeting proved that we struggled mightily to understand what people were saying when they spoke through a mask. That having been said, will the, will the clerk please read the call of meeting and return of service? Plymouth SS, greetings to the constable of the town of Duxbury in said county. In the name of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, you are directed to notify and warn the inhabitants of the town of Duxbury qualified to vote in elections and in town affairs to meet in the Duxbury Schools Performing Arts Center, 73 Alden Street in said Duxbury on Monday, the eighth day of November, 2021, next, at seven o'clock p.m. for a special town meeting for the transaction of any business that may legally come before said meeting. And you are hereby directed to serve this warrant by posting attested copies thereof as prescribed by Mass General Law Chapter 39, Section 10, and by Chapter 2, Section 2.3.1 of the Town of Duxbury General Bylaws at least 14 days before the time of holding said meeting. Hereof fail not and make due return of this warrant with your doings thereon to the town clerk at the time and place of this meeting, given under our hands this 18th day of October, 2021, Board of Selectmen, Amy M. McNabb, Chair, Cynthia Ladd Fiorini, Clerk, Theodore J. Flynn, Michael McGee. Plymouth SS, October 19, 2021. Pursuant to the warrant, I have this day notified and warned the inhabitants of the town of Duxbury, herein described, to meet at the time and place and for the purposes as described by the bylaws of the town. A true copy attested, Mitchell Lebret, Constable of Duxbury. Unless there's some objection, we'll dispense with reading of the warrant. Before, as we begin, I'd ask that you join me in the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands. I want to start by thanking all of you for coming out to this meeting so that we conduct the important business of the town. I'd like to start by introducing some people you see in, in front of you. Um, in the front of the hall on your right and my left is the Board of Selectmen. Um, we have uh, Mr. McGee, Mr. Flynn, uh, Cynthia Ladd Fiorini, Fernando Guitart, Amy McNabb sitting next to them, or as our town manager, is our director of finance, John Adams, and our town manager, Rainy Reed. Up here on the platform with me are town clerk, Susan Kelly, assistant town clerk, Linda Savati, and town council, Jeffrey Blake. Um, on my right, your left, we have the finance committee. Um, we have the chair, Betsy Sullivan, friend Weiler, Kathleen Glynn, Is it Al Hoban? <laughs> Thank you. Um, Nate Taylor, Jerry Pisani. Oh, Jack Kent and, and Shannon Gooden. And Peter Sullivan. And Peter Sullivan. I appreciate all the help as we go through this. Um, and my name is John Tuffy. Believe it or not, I'm the moderator. Um, and I'm supposed to know these people. Um, this is a couple of announcements. The hall today is divided into six voting sections, numbered as follows. Section one is the small section on the main floor in the front to my left. Section two is the center section in front of me. Section three is the small section in the front to my right. 
Section four is the section of the balcony in the rear to my left. Section five is the center of the section of the balcony. And six is the section of the balcony to my right. Visitors will be seated in the rear of section one to my left, uh, and that's the non-voting section. Please note that if a hand count is taken, the tellers will not be counting voters who are seated in a non-voting section. Microphones for your use are located in the back of the hall at the, at the, at the um, foot of each of the balcony's aisles where the stairs meet the main floor behind voting sections one and three on the main floor and in front between the selectmen and finance committee table. Assisted listening devices are available at the table next to the entrance in the front door uh, behind section one. They're provided by the Municipal Commission on Disabilities. The fire chief has requested that I point out this, the fire exits from this room. There are two fire exits on the lower level of the auditorium, one to my, one to my immediate right, your left, and one on my left. When you entered the room, there's also two fire exits at the upper level of the room at the rear of the hall behind the balconies. The fire chief has also requested you not sit in the aisles or on the stairs between the balcony and the main floor, and I request that all cell phones be turned off while the meeting is in session, except for public safety officials. For your information, this meeting is being taped. I'd like to review a couple of town meeting procedures with you before we go forward. If I'm unable to determine if there's a majority voice vote, we will use a hand count. If seven or more voters immediately question my determination, we will have a hand count. Upon checking in, registered voters were issued colored cards. Yep. The card entitles you to be seated in the voting section. If a hand count becomes necessary, the card must be held up. When the vote is counted, the tellers have been instructed to count only votes cast by people who are holding colored cards in their hands and are seated in the voting section. If you lose your card, please go to the teller's desk, which is in the back of the room, and they will issue a new one. To assure accuracy, all hand votes, all hand counted votes would be counted by two tellers. This may require some additional time and request your cooperation. At this point in our town meeting, we customarily vote to give permission to speak to town employees and officials who are not registered voters in the town of Duxbury. Accordingly, I will entertain a motion to allow our town employees and officials to speak should the occasion arise. So moved. I have a motion that's been seconded. Um, all those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed, the ayes have it. It's a unanimous vote. This meeting is governed by the statutes of our town bylaws and town meeting time. In addition, I suggest we abide by the following procedures so that we may conduct the business of the meeting in an orderly fashion. After I have announced that we are considering an article, the article will be moved by the Finance Committee and their recommendation will be heard. I will then give the, po the proposer of the article the opportunity of making their opening remarks. In those cases where there is an organized or recognized opposition to an article, which has been identified to me, I will then give the opponent of the article the opportunity of making their opening remarks. I request that all presenters limit their remarks to a maximum of 10 minutes. Upon completion of these presentations, the matter will be open for general debate. If you wish to speak, I request that you go to one of the microphones. After you've been recognized by me, would you please identify yourself by name and street address? I also request that all speakers limit their remarks to a maximum of five minutes and ask that speakers do not attempt to be recognized for a second time on the discussion of any article until every other person who wishes to speak has had the opportunity to do so for the first time. Any lengthy or complicated motions or amendments should be submitted in writing so that we will know precisely what's being voted upon and we can maintain an accurate record of the proceedings. Um, one, other I, one other item I want to mention, and that is the motion for the previous question, or move the question as it's sometimes called. A motion to move ends debate. It takes a two-thirds vote. It's a useful motion at town meetings but there are some concerns that it may be abused unfairly, and to that end, we have two, two procedures. First, I will not accept a motion for the previous question from somebody who's just finished speaking on an article. Uh, this eliminates uh, the motion for the previous question as a vehicle to get in the last word. And the second procedure is intended to assure that both proponents and opponents of an article have an opportunity to speak before debate is ended by a motion to move the question. Uh, before we start to 
Before we start the main business of the meeting, our, our town administrator, town manager, Mr. Reed, has requested to make a few comments. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. <clears throat> Good evening, everyone, and thank you for attending this evening's special town meeting. As all of you know, about a week and a half ago, we had a storm hit us that was one of the most severe weather events many of us had seen in quite some time. As a result, it left us all without power for a period of time, some more significantly than others, and complete restoration didn't happen for almost a week. Since we're all here tonight together, I wanted to just take a moment to thank some of the folks who worked throughout the nights and days to make our roads safe for passage and respond to the variety of emergent situations that arose as a result of the storm. And if I call your name out or if you're affiliated with any of these organizations, I'd appreciate it if you could stand. Our DPW director, Peter Butkus, and the entire DPW team. Our fire chief, Kevin Nord, deputy fire chief, Rob Reardon. And of course, the entire fire department. Chief Steve McDonald and deputy, Mark, D deputy chief, Mike Carbone, and the entire police department. And I, I, I think he's already left the meeting, but Mike Woodford, our IT director, who made sure that we could all communicate with each other throughout the event. It's an honor and a privilege to work alongside such a talented and dedicated team of people, and I'm very fortunate to do so. And also, as a resident like you, uh, I feel even luckier to know that they're all watching out for each of us, and you have our sincerest gratitude. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Reed. And Mrs. Solomon, may we, may we have a motion under Article 1? Article 1, Conservation Land Purchase, Old Cordwood Path. I move that the town, as recommended by the Community Preservation Committee, A, authorize the Board of Selectmen to acquire by purchase, gift, or eminent domain, and on such terms and conditions as the Board of Selectmen deems to be in the best interests of the town for conservation, open space, agricultural, water supply protection, and passive recreation purchase purposes, all or a portion of the parcels of land located on and off Old Cordwood Path and Enterprise Road which parcels contain 64.43 acres, more or less, in the aggregate are identified by the Duxbury assessors as parcels 086-015-006, 087-018-101, 087-020-003, and 087-020-001 and are a portion of the premises described in a deed recorded with the Plymouth County Registry of Deeds in Book 43957, page 20, together with an agricultural easement on assessor's um, parcel 087-981-002, and water rights and delivery rights, which parcels shall be under the care, custody, and control of the Conservation Commission pursuant to the provisions of General Law Chapter 40, Section 8C, and a right of first refusal and option to purchase the parcel of land located at 87 Old Cordwood Path, parcel 087-018-103, B, appropriate the sum of $2,100,000 for the purpose of funding said acquisition and costs incidental or related thereto, of which $600,000 is transferred from the Community Preservation Unreserved Undesignated Fund Balance and $1,500,000 is borrowed and to authorize the treasurer with the approval of the Board of Selectmen to borrow 
some under Mass General Law Chapter 44B, Section 11, and or any other enabling authority, and to issue bonds or notes on the town therefore, and any premium received by the town upon the sale of any bonds or notes approved by this vote, less any such premium applied to costs of insurance of such bonds or notes, may be applied to the costs approved by this vote with a reduction of borrowing authority, therefore, by a like amount in accordance with Mass General Law Chapter 44, Section 20. C, authorize the Board of Selectmen to apply for, accept, and expend any funds that may be provided by the Commonwealth or other public or private sources to defray all or a portion of the costs of said acquisition, including, but not limited to, grants and or reimbursement from the Commonwealth under the Self-Help Act, General Law Chapter 132A, Section 11, now so-called land grants, which grants and or funds so received shall be used to repay all or a portion of the sum appropriated from the Community Preservation Fund hereunder, and to enter into all agreements and execute any and all instruments as may be necessary or appropriate to effectuate the foregoing acquisition. D, authorize the Board of Selectmen to grant and or accept deed restrictions pursuant to the provisions of Mass General Law Chapter 184, Sections 31 through 33, in compliance with General Law Chapter 44B, Section 12A in the portions of the property dedicated to one or more of the aforesaid purposes, and further, E, authorize the Board of Selectmen in consultation with the Conservation Commission to enter into management agreements for up to 10 years as may be necessary for the purposes of this article on terms deemed by the Board of Selectmen in consultation with the Conservation Commission to be in the best interest of the town. Second. Uh, Finance Committee voted 8-0 to recommend. And, bef and before Mr. Mr. Grady starts his presentation, I would mention that the Board of Selectmen voted 4-0 to recommend as well. Ms. Grady, the floor is yours. Good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for coming out tonight. Um, I'm going to try something a little different tonight. Uh, PAC TV was kind enough to put together a very short three minute video that describes the details of this article. And there was some nice drone footage that we could enjoy tonight that will show you the property that we're discussing. So I'd like to, rather than make a speech, I'd like to show you a video that was prepared by PAC TV. And I think it'll give you a good sense of what's going on and what we're looking for tonight. Duxbury's town meeting is on November 8th and one article concerns the purchase of 65 acres of land that is now a working cranberry bog adjacent to the Wright Reservoir. The current owners are willing to sell parts of the land to the town for conservation. We met up with Duxbury's conservation administrator on site to learn more. I'm Joe Grady. I'm the Conservation Administrator for the Town of Duxbury. We're here today to look at the Red Eye Cranberry Farm located off of Old Cordwood Path in Duxbury. The Conservation Commission and the Community Preservation Committee are hoping to purchase this land for $2 million. It consists of 65 acres of open space with approximately 27 acres of actively farmed cranberries. The purchase for this property will come from the Community Preservation Fund, which raises money through real estate taxes and money matching funds from the state of Massachusetts. The reservoir also on the property is 35 acres in size and was built by William J. Wright in 1895. The town presently owns 200 acres on the two thirds of the reservoir and by adding this piece to those 200 acres, we'll be able to provide a walking trail around the entire circumference of the Wright Reservoir. 
Additionally, the land serves as a source of water supply for the town. There are presently uh, drinking water wells nearby and future drinking water wells. So by adding this open space, we'll have almost 300 acres of protected land in this area. The, uh, the Wright Reservoir uh, has been on the list of lands looking for preservation since 1969. So it's taken us nearly 50 years to get to this point, but we're thrilled that the Pink family is offering it to the town of Duxbury. So now if I may, Holly Morris, chair of the Community Preservation Committee, can talk a little bit about how we're going to pay for this piece. Oh, God. Ah, thank you. Again, um, thank you, Joe. That was a great presentation. And I'm sorry I don't have a movie to show for finances. <laughs> Um, I'm Holly Morris. I'm the chair of the CPC. And um, I also would like to thank John Adams uh, for assisting the CPC with all the financial details and running the debt service scenarios that are so important for this article. <clears throat> Looking forward to fiscal year 2023, we are projecting approximately $600,000 in local surcharge receipts. That's the 1% surcharge on your real estate taxes for CPA. The state reimbursement or the state match is projected in the ballpark of $150,000 to $170,000. We are only eligible for the first round of funding because we reduced our surcharge from 3% to 1% years ago. 30% of these combined receipts is divided equally, which is roughly $70,000 into the three purposes which is open space, affordable housing, and, his, and historic preservation. 5% of the money goes towards administrative expenses, which is legal, any land improvements, um, consulting fees. What is remaining in the annual estimated revenue is projected for fiscal year 2023 is roughly $500,000. After an annual audit, that 500,000 goes into the undesignated fund balance. The CPC recently closed out a number of completed articles totaling $162,000 and deposited these funds into that undesignated account. This account is now roughly $1.2 million. Current CPC outstanding debt is $625,000 due to the purchase of 761 Temple Street. The balance in open space, affordable housing, and historic preservation were significantly drawn down, and these accounts need to grow. We plan to have the preservation restriction and site plan for 761 Temple approved at the annual town meeting in March so that we can sell the house and recapture much of those funds. Now, to the pink property, we're talking about <clears throat> 2.1 million for that property. It's an outstanding property. It has been on our radar for 50 years, and now we have a willing seller. The CPC is recommending to, to town meeting that we spend 600,000 from the CPA undesignated account <clears throat> excuse me, 500 for the purchase and 100,000 for associated expenses. And we are recommending borrowing 1.5 million. We are anticipating a term of 20 years and the debt service will be paid from the CPA revenue. Even with the Temple Street farm debt, we anticipate nearly 200,000 will be available for annual appropriations. And as you can see, this will certainly have an impact on future appropriations and land acquisitions, given the value of land in our town. We hope you, we can get your vote on this invaluable property. Thank you.
Are there any questions or comments? Seeing none, I'm going to call for. Oh, we do have one. All right. So I have somebody over here on my left. We'll, we'll take her, and then somebody else said they had a question. I'd ask you to come to a microphone. Please. Elizabeth Lewis, 62 Bravender Way. Quick question. We've seen the CPC funding go up and down in this town. What happens if next year the town decides to stop funding that 1%? I mean, I, I think it's a wonderful purchase, but we're borrowing out 20 years, and there's no guarantee next year that those CPC funds will be available. We'll see if we can't get you an answer. Mr. Adams or Mr. Adams or, or Ms. Ha Morris. I'll go up there. Mr. Adams is our finance yes. director with the town of Duxbury. John Adams, finance director. With the uh, CPC funds, once you have committed to a debt service uh, for purchases of property or, or whatever capital the CPA has purchased with debt, um, any that debt comes first priority. So even if the CPC then is um, decided to not to continue with the CPC, you would still have to fund enough to pay the debt service um, through the through the surcharge. Does that answer your question? Thank you, Mr. Adams. Gentleman oh, to my right. I am Fred Lequiave from uh, Washington Street. And I have uh, some simple questions. If this were a corporation and we were purchasing another firm, there would be a, a great deal of study to make sure there were no ecological problems. So my basic question is, since this has been used in farming and it's an aquatic environment, DDT has a 150-year half-life. So my question is, has any testing been done to make sure that we're not taking on yet another water quality kind of problem or one where we will have to remediate whatever is in there? Simple question. Mr. Mr. Grady. The town has contracted with Conoco to perform a phase one assessment of the property, and they will provide the town with, any, with a full report before we close on the property, and any outstanding issues will be resolved that is outlined in the purchase and sale agreement. So, Joe, I'm not familiar with CONCO. Could you elaborate a little bit? A phase one is a commonly used assessment that's performed, particularly when um, lenders are providing money for properties. And it, uh, they visit the site, they do research to see if there's been any uh, spills. Um, if anything does come up that hits certain thresholds, you go to the next level, which is you actually go in and you test the soil. And if things are, re are found in the soil, then the soil is actually removed. So it's a step-by-step -step process, and we are in the process of completing phase one at this point. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Gentlemen to my left. Thank you, John. David Hines, 50 Screenhouse Lane. I support the purchase of this land by the town for four reasons. One, additional water supply. This purchase will create four additional groundwater wells. Clean, safe, and adequate drinking water is critical to our town and our future. Water is no longer a commodity. It's an increasingly limited and valuable resource to a town. Maintaining water independence is also less expensive to taxpayers. Number two, strategic value. By buying these 65 acres, the town is expanding open space and conservation land around the Wright Reservoir. By adding to existing conservation land acquired, 
we are leveraging prior investments to expand this land and create a larger conservation footprint. Protecting this specific land has been a top conservation priority by the town for over 50 years, and now we have an opportunity, opportunity to secure it. Number three, passive recreation. During the pandemic, my first few walks after the lockdown were around the Wright Reservoir. The Pink family has always been gracious in allowing people to walk the perimeter of the property. The proposed walking trails around the reservoir will offer walkers unique vistas around this body of water. Kids in the area fish there today, and more will have an opportunity to do so. This natural and tranquil place will benefit citizens and families for generations to come. And finally, fourth, lower taxes. 10 acres of this land is developable and could become another 40B high density housing project. We know more build out of our town increases taxes for all of us as we need to invest in additional services to support a larger town. Buying and protecting this land is less expensive to us as taxpayers. For these reasons, I encourage you to vote yes on this article. I'd like to thank Joe Grady, the Conservation Committee, the CPA Committee, and the Pink family for bringing this opportunity forward. We will not regret a decision to purchase this unique property, nor will future generations who will only thank us for what we did tonight. Thank you. Sue Schofield, James Road. So I have two questions. If town decides, if we decide to purchase this land, where will we be able to access the land for parking to t go on to the walking trails? That's my first question. And the second question is, are they ever going to build houses here? Is there going to be a Habitat for Humanity house? What's going to protect this land from building? Are we going to decide to farm it someday? So are, are there going to be deeds put in place to protect it as is? Thank you. So as far as parking goes, there was a handout um, in the lobby. If you have that, it do you shows have a Do you have a laser pointer you could? help us with that. Oh, okay. Thank you. I don't know, does this work as a pointer? There it is, right here. There is an existing parking lot that we created for the Williams Preserve. We'll be expanding that. It's off of Church Street on a small side spur, which is called Frontage Road. It's right, right in this area here where the large P is. And as far as uh, permanent restrictions on the property. We do expect to farm the property, um, and we do plan to put a permanent conservation restriction, which is a permanent restriction with the state of Massachusetts and usually a third party. Usually the Wildlands Trust holds it and actually inspects the property on an annual basis and makes sure that we're conforming to the requirements of the restriction. And also conservation land, when it's purchased and deeded to the commission, it's the most protected land in the state of Massachusetts. In order for it to be converted to something else, it requires a vote of this body, town, town meeting, a vote of the Conservation Commission, a vote of the House and the Senate, as well as the governor has to sign it, and it has to go through the MEPA process, and there has to be compensatory land made up. So it's the most restricted, most protected land in the state of Massachusetts, and it also will have a permanent conservation restriction on top of that as well. Thank you. If you'd, in, if you'd just introduce yourself. Kate Reynolds, 67 Bravender Way. Um, I was just a follow-up question to the farming question. Um, are there any plans to clear the remaining 40 or so acres for farming? No, there's no plans to expand the farming on this piece of property, other than the cranberries that are grown on 27 acres. Are we ready for a vote? Uh, this, is, this article in, includes borrowing, and so it's going to take a two-thirds vote. Um, um, if you're in favor of this, please say aye. Aye. If you're opposed? 
the ayes have it with minimal um, opposition. Article 2, Mrs. Sullivan. Subject, environmental assessment of the former Duxbury Landfill, Inc. Um, slash McNeil dump property. I move that the town appropriate the sum of $38,165 to conduct an initial environmental assessment of the form, former, I believe is what you meant, um, Duxbury Landfill, Inc. slash McNeil dump property and to meet said appropriation transfer $38,165 from free cash to be expended under the direction of the town manager. Second. Board of Selectmen voted 4-0 to recommend. Finance Committee voted 8-0 to recommend. Any, any questions? Any comments? Hearing none. I'll, whoop, we do have one. Two. We have two. Hello, uh, Sheila Lynch Benton in 344 West Street. I'd like to um, point out that last week the Federal House and Federal Senate just passed a $1.2 trillion infrastructure bill that President Biden is scheduled to sign next week, November 15th. And in that bill is $21 billion in, in environmental remediation. Six billion for brownfields, six hundred billion for affordable housing, and the money requires twenty percent match for municipalities, and that um, EPA has already written the guidelines about establishing community partnerships to close remediated brownfields, such as providing affordable housing. And I would recommend, with some of this money, um, the monies from the federal government, no matter what you think of what, um, who passed what and all the characters involved, there will not be billions available next year. There will be trillions for brownfield remediation, affordable housing, and partnerships. And the um, EPA guidance is engage the community, establish partnerships for remediated brownfields. So I would hope that this money be used to form a committee of um, the Duxbury Safe Water Group, the um, Senior Housing, Affordable Housing, the Water Department, the um, and DPW and other the um, water committee to apply for the monies that will be available next year. Duxbury can get out of paying consultants, which yeah. this will be multi-million dollars to. So anyways, for this initial property assessment, the EPA will pay for it. And 38,000, so, I think, is good for the town to start, but it also includes in the article future assessment. So my recommendation that is that some of this be formed for a committee to apply for the monies that will be available next year. Thank you. I, I appreciate your, your concern. I'm going to suggest that we can't. The, the article is very clear in that it, the purpose is for the initial environmental assessment of the landfill, not, not to fund a, a uh, separate town committee. So I suggest that you talk to town manager about an alternate funding source or bring it to the annual town meeting? Well, my problem with that is that um, it, in the article it says initial site reports, excavation of test pits, advancement of soil lining, mounting wells, groundwater studies, and it includes additional. So I'm just saying that before we go down the rabbit hole of Duxbury spending millions on remediating the McNeil dump, that we so, so apply. If I, so I'm going to suggest that what you're saying is you, 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 you're opposed to the article and would vote no. Is that accurate? I think we should um, oppose the article and amend the article. Okay. And Got I it. have an amendment. Mr. Reed. 
Thank you, Mr. Moderator. The purpose of the article is to actually fund a contract which the town, uh, for which the town issued RFPs over the summer, uh, last summer. Uh, Weston and Sampson was the low bidder, uh, and they'll be the ones doing the environmental assessment related to the McNeil dump. We are aware of the uh, moves done by the uh, House and Senate at the federal level, uh, and we hope to be able to see what it is they're proposing. Uh, and of course, if there is grant funding available for that in the future, we will seek it out. But in this case, this is very specific to a contract that we are ready to engage upon uh, should the voters approve the article. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. My name is Tanya Trevison, uh, 21 Tinkers Ledge Road, and I'm one of the founders of the Duxbury Safe Water Committee. Um, just as a point of clarification um, for myself, uh, I was wondering about the, the amount um, of the proposed assessment, because uh, last meeting at the Board of Health, I understand that um, the contract was to be reviewed to determine whether or not PFAS was going to be tested as well. And I'm not sure, <clears throat> excuse me, if this particular amount um, incorporates that testing. It would. It does. Mr. Reed, could I ask you to go to the microphone? Share those thoughts with the rest of us. The answers are it was, it does, and it will. And I appreciate that very clear, succinct answer. Thank you, as I suspect everybody else does. Any other comments or questions? Are we ready for a vote? All those in favor of Article Number 2, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed? The ayes have it as unanimous. Article Number 3, Mrs. Sullivan. Unpaid bills. I move that the town authorize the sum of $1,583 to pay the following unpaid bills out of the current year's budget from the departments in sums as follows. Line one, Robert Higgins, water, $425. Line two, John Hoadley and Sons, Inc., water, $157.50. Line three, Plymouth County Sheriff's Department, Department Land and Natural Resources, $234. Line four, Glynn Electric, uh, Department is Facilities, $388. Line 5, Kalari Automotive, Inc., DPW, $97.50. Line 6, E&E Systems, Inc., from facilities, $281 for the total of $1,583. Board of Selectmen voted 4-0 to recommend. Finance Committee voted 8-0 to recommend. Second. Are there any questions? Since this is dealing with, with an, an expense that was incurred last year, last fiscal year, and it will be paid out of, out of this year's budget, it takes a nine-tenths vote. Um, pretty darn close to unanimous. So I'm going to ask for your vote now. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed? The ayes have it. It's unanimous. Thank you. Article number four, Mrs. Sullivan. Supplemental appropriations. I move that the town appropriate the sum of $35,000 by transfer from available funds, parentheses free cash, close parentheses, to supplement appropriations previously voted under Article 5 of the annual town meeting of May 15, 2021, for the fiscal year beginning July 1, 2021, for the line items in the budgets of various town departments as follows. Item 1. Department 419, DPW, Administration General Expenses. The budget was 68,250. The adjustment is 28,000. The revised um, FY22 budget is $96,250. Funding source, free cash. Line two, um, Department 192, DPW, Central Buildings General Expenses. The budget was $207,280. The adjustment is $7,000. The revised FY22 budget is $214,280. Funding source is free cash. Total adjustments, $35,000.
Recommendations, Board of Selectmen 4-0 to recommend. Finance Committee voted 8-0 to recommend. Second. Mr. Adams, did you have some, some comments? John Adams, Finance Director. Uh, just before the questions are asked, probably some people probably ask, well, what, what is it? Um, so under the, there are two items under DPW administration, general expenses. One is to Weston and Sampson for 15000 for the continued uh, consulting work on the DPW facility. Uh, and the second item is for the stormwater permit, permitting consultants, environmental partners, in the amount of 13000 So that equals to 28000 and for DPW central buildings, general expenses, that's for additional cleaning services uh, while our custodian was out. Any questions or comments? I'm gonna ask for a vote now, it's a majority vote. All those in favor of, of Article 4, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed? The ayes have it, it's unanimous. Article number five. Article number five is a citizen's petition dealing with um, uh, Summer Street and a previous action taken. Because it's a citizen's petition and, and no surprise if you look at your warrant, um, it, is not, it is not being recommended by the Se Selectment of Finance Committee. Um, the, Mrs. Sullivan will make the motion and then it will be addressed by the petitioner. They will make their very, they will be the first, the first um, presentation you'll hear, then that'll be followed by uh, some town people who, town employees who are opposed to it. Mrs. Sullivan. Um, if you're, if you have copies of the motions, this was revised, um, so um, I will read it. Article five, uh, to see if the town will vote to request that the Town Conservation Commission not move forward with plans to clear or alter the land through removal of trees or vegetation located at zero Summer Street containing 27.32 acres and shown on a plan of land on file at the office of the town clerk owned by the town of Duxbury slash Conservation Commission and identified by assessor's reference 031-502-047 until such a time when further study can be done. Second. Thank you. Motion's been made and seconded? Yes. Yes, I did. Yes. yes. Um, Second. Ms. Reynolds, would you like to speak to it? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, I hope to just take 10 minutes of your time to talk about why we formed the citizen petition. Um, my name is Kate Reynolds. I live at 67 Ravender Way. It's my distinct pleasure to be presenting the citizen's petition. Nope. Um, okay. My name is Kate Reynolds. I live at 67 Ravender Way. Um, this photo here is Summer Street, AKA DiLorenzo. This is deemed open space, permanent, protected town land. The concern is that the Conservation Commission has approved their own plans to clear cut 10 acres of forest here in order to create new farmland. Um, the trees you see in this photo are some of what will be cleared. Voters have known since buying it in 2018 that farmland was planned here, but we didn't have all the information we needed to make informed decisions when voting. We didn't know that deforestation would need to happen. The wording of the citizens' petitions changed recently to reflect the feedback provided by town council at select board meeting on October 18th. Um, the original wording was ineffectual legally. Um, we didn't have access to town council before then. The concerns remain the same, and the new wording provides an opportunity for voters to request that the Conservation Commission pause clearing of the land until more data can be gathered and the gathering of the data would be in keeping with the activities of local conservation commissions, which they routinely take part in, such as surveying vernal pools um, and coming up with a strategic plan before breaking ground or tree clearing. So if you want to move on to the next slide. Um, I don't know if there's any Godfather fans out there, but um, 
Just a note, a word of note, this petition is not a referendum on any one person or group of people. It's not personal. It's just voters voting. Um, there are no villains here, and it's OK to disagree. It's certainly not anti-conservation commission. I was thrilled to vote yes on Article 1 today. There are good people doing good work. And it's certainly not anti-farm. I personally love the idea of a working farm in Duxbury, and I look forward to welcoming one. Um, the point here is let's not get sidetracked by any of that. Let's focus on the science and facts and speak them plainly. Um, let's strengthen the checks and balances starting with Summer Street because what we have now is a bit of a cart before the horse situation. If you want to move on to slide three, please. So let's review what we did vote on. Um, in 2018, we purchased the um, property and Actually, the wording was identical to what we just saw in the pink parcel. It's for purposes of open space, agriculture, water supply protection, and passive recreation. The explanation um, used the term restore to farmland use. So we were all familiar with how Conservation Commission, much like the pink parcel, um, can be used in agriculture. Um, in 2020, it came up again during the COVID edition uh, annual town meeting. It was part of a seven uh, article CPC consent agenda, so it was voted in one lump at the end of the meeting. Um, the title of it was Farmland Improvements to the DiLorenzo Farm. Um, and some of the wording um, that it used said, in order to reach the goal, prime farmland soils need to be cleared of brush and trees and irrigation wells must be installed. Trash in the property will also be removed. So it was a, like a, a shoulder shrug vote. Okay, sounds good, let's move it along. Um, and the photo you see here is also another photo from the property looking from the historic O'Neill hayfields. These trees will also be set to be cleared um, by the approved plans. We can go on to the next slide, please. And the deed itself indicates that this land is to be used for conservation and passive recreation purposes. Next slide, please. So what we didn't know when we voted was actually a lot of crucial things. The main thing being what was on the land. There were no abandoned fields waiting to be dusted off like the cranberry bogs. This land has not seen crops in close to 100 years. It was last a turkey farm 50 years ago. So Summer Street is actually a 100-year-old forest with beautiful, wild, well-established vernal pool cluster. Because this property is hidden from view, none of us would necessarily know that. Even as an abutter, I can't see the property from my backyard because of dense forest. But boy, do we see the wildlife that the vernal pool attracts. I want you to keep coming back to this um, list of costs as I, as I talk, because it turns out that it costs money to tear down a forest to put in a farm. Um, right now, phase one is somewhere in the ballpark of like 66,000, but could very much be higher um, for the funds that were approved last year. But we don't know what the budget is going to be ultimately. Um, there's a cost to climate. I, I have no idea, but I would say maybe there's a 1,000 trees on that 10 acres, and they make a gorgeous carbon sink. The older trees get, the, older trees get, the better they get at trapping and storing carbon. Um, clean drinking water, this it, property is entirely over an aquifer, Duxbury's only source of drinking water. So what will pesticides, fertilizers, and soil disruptions mean? Ecology, it's a wildlife habitat. This vernal pools are essential breeding and feeding sites, and they're disappearing every day because of human encroachment. Um, there's also health consequences. If you go to slide number, the next slide, please. This map became available only August of 2021. Um, it accompanied the NOI notice. I received notice of the NOI as an abutter, expressed my concerns, and um, reached out after the hearing, um, which I attended. And the CONCOM graciously took me on a site visit along with the select board, which was very informative. If you go on to the next slide, you'll see I shaded in the maps based on that site visit. Um, you have them in your handout, so I won't spend much time on them. But just taking in the overall point, you can see comparing the left to the right that a lot of trees are coming down. And it's 
the habitat immediately surrounding that ecologically valuable vernal pool cluster, all those blue are vernal pools. Um, because that is where the good soil is. They've tested the soil and are trying to maximize clearing where there is prime soil for agriculture. So this habitat is being targeted because the soil underneath it is seen as more valuable than what's on top. Um, as many of you probably know, vernal pools are temporary seasonal bodies of water that are crucial breeding habitats for reptiles, amphibians, and vertebrates. However, these species go on to spend 90% of their adult lives well beyond the bounds of the, the Blue Basin. They'll go on into the forest, the uplands. So it's not just about protecting those blue dots. It's about protecting the entire connectedness of the ecosystem, the basin, the upland forest, and the wetlands. And that comes from the director of conservation, Maine Audubon Society. I can assure you this is not NIMBY. Um, I don't think a butter is a bad word um, when it comes to having concerns. But for me, my view doesn't change from my backyard. There'll be no trucks lumbering by my house. My concerns were born out of true concern for the wildlife that we see flourishing just off our property by the vernal pool. It's a gift, and I don't want there to be a spring when we don't hear the peepers in the pond. When you cut off vernal pools like this, there is a good chance they won't support life in the same way. And I included in the handout a list of expert quotes that reflect that. Um, so the next slide, please. If we pull back a bit, that yellow circle is the property. You can see the, the high T's is that brown stripe going down the middle. Um, this is clearly part of a wildlife migratory path at Western Greenbelt. Um, you'll see Lower Chandler Pond, which is one of our, our drinking water wells on Lakeshore Drive. Um, if you look on NHESP map you, in this area, there are no other vernal pool, pool clusters like it. So if these go away, I don't know where we're expecting the wildlife to go, and we lose out on that biodiversity that becomes so important in conservation. Um, next slide, please. So this has been the formula that has been working, right, for Open Space and Conservation Committee. Um, you preserve the land how you find it. So I'm not sure why it's different here and why we weren't told it would be different when we were voting in 2018 and 20. Next slide, please. So what is there now? Well, what's there now is absolutely beautiful. Like I said, this, this place has had 100 years undisrupted um, to let nature do what it wants to do. Um, vernal pools are like the big Y of the neighborhood, and we see a lot of activity. That eastern box turtle in the upper right corner there, we documented just off the property last year, and that's listed by the NHESP as a species of special concern. Um, and those photos there are also some of the trees that will be gone. Next slide, please. Um, so, Conservation, has claimed, Conservation Commission has claimed that wildlife and our natural resources are fully protected in this plan by simply following the regulations. They might be complying with all the regulations, but honestly, we spend money on conservation land not simply for the bare minimum. We have come to expect best management practices from CONCOM again, and they've delivered time and time again. And this time should be no different. So you see the best management practices allow for far more generous buffers when it comes to vernal pools. Um, and you'll compare that, say the, the 400 to 700 feet of best management practice with the 25 feet that the current plan is proposing. It's simply not enough. Um, and plus, how would anyone know after the trees come down if species that rely on the vernal pool were affected without baseline data? There have been no field studies to look at what species are there to begin with. So we have nothing to compare it to. Um, next slide, please. We spent a lot, Duxbury has spent a lot of money, time, people power on strategic plans. And we should consult them. That's the whole point. Um, open space um, plan, it clearly, it was designed to offer clear guidance to our town boards town boards about decision making. And it also serves as an informal agreement with citizens of what they can expect. The objectives clearly support the ideas behind this petition. The first two important objectives identified are protection of drinking water and protection of natural habitat. 
There is an objective three, which in part includes protection of agriculture, but you can't protect something that does not exist. This is not currently farmland. In fact, there is no mention of any need or goal to create new farmland. And this, the Conservation Commission is never tasked with carrying out the agricultural objectives listed. So we, we're running this risk of Conservation Commission morphing more into Agricultural Commission in this case. Envision Duxbury, similar story. It's a, it was a public process through which people of Duxbury decided future priorities to guide growth and development, and there was zero mention of new farmland. But over and over, it's repeated that the residents value clean drinking water, protection of nature as open space. Climate resiliency report, of course, is going to favor um, not taking down 10 acres of trees. Um, you can go on to the next slide, please. So what about the agricultural strategic plan? Um, good question. I don't think one exists. I could be wrong. But our agricultural commission community deserves one. We need a strategic plan before we start taking down nature on conservation land. The end goal of a working farm in Duxbury is a lovely one, but the path to get there here is not a lovely one. This land deserves our very best. I want to keep hearing the Peepers Chorus announcing the beginning of spring. Next slide, please. Our town, our town leaders have voted on this, and what they have unanimously indicated is that they cannot see the forest for the farm in this case. The plan has become paramount to all else. So I'm putting it to you, the voters. Can you see the forest, the vernal pools, the wildlife, clean drinking water, clean air, the need for an agricultural strategic plan to help guide these decisions? I hope you do. Please vote yes. Thank you. Mr. Grady, I believe you have something you want to say? Good evening again. I'm Joe Grady. I'm the conservation administrator. I also reside at 10 Wendell Pond Road in Duxbury. I want to tell you about the history of this property. We actually started 15 years ago with the De Lorenzo family trying to purchase the property. The reason that we tried to purchase the property was that the commission received a map from the Natural Resource Conservation Service showing that more than 40% of the property contains prime farmland soil. This decision was also guided by the open space plan which states protect and preserve agricultural land. In discussions with the owners, it was learned that the land had been farmed for more than 40 years. After reaching a purchase agreement, the commission went to the 2018 town meeting and voters agreed to buy the land for purposes that included agriculture and authorized the selectmen to enter into 10-year farm agreements to manage the land. In 2020, we again went to town meeting to secure funds for land clearing, installation of irrigation wells, and trash removal on the property. Town meeting approved those funds. As many of you know, the process of bringing articles to town meeting involves review by numerous committees. This project was discussed and voted at on in 13 public meetings. Town meeting articles and their description were printed in the Duxbury Clipper, and two site walks were offered to the public. The Conservation Commission recently approved wetlands permits to perform this restoration project. During this meeting, the Commission applied local rules and regulations to the project and voted to allow the work to proceed. The same permit was reviewed by the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection. They also approved the permit. The review of this wetlands application received the same scrutiny to strict standards as all Duxbury projects. In fact, under our local bylaw, 65% of this property will be left untouched. 
35% will be restored to working agricultural fields. This is a reasonable project. Duxbury is well served by an experienced conservation commission with its seven members serving a total of 87 years in their positions. This is not a responsibility any of them take lightly. These individuals developed the town's own wetlands protection bylaw, which is much stricter than the state law, and those standards were applied to this project. There is a lot of discussion around vernal pools on this site. The pools on the De Lorenzo farm will continue to function the way they do today when the farm is up and running. We have plenty of examples in Duxbury where healthy vernal pools are located within farmed areas. The Berry Brook and North Hill fields, where hay is cut up to three times in a growing season, have large vernal pools right in the middle of the hay fields. At the O'Neill farm, cows graze in pastures next to vernal pools. Presently, we have 60 acres of hay fields, 132 acres of cranberry bogs, and a three-acre Christmas tree farm. All of these farms require extensive tree cutting as normal maintenance. Nearby forest is continually trying to grow towards open, sunlit areas on these farms. Tree removal is a continual activity in farming. A no vote on Article 5 is a vote to support farming in Duxbury. Thank you. Just a minute. Mr. Grady? I was going to say, I, was going to say, I believe that, that part of your presentation is, is... Ms. Cross, if you'll just introduce yourself. Yes, I'm, I'm Kathy Cross. I'm chair of the Open Space Committee, and I'm also the liaison for the Open Space to Community Preservation. Um, I'd just like to take a few minutes to talk tonight to talk about... To talk about um, the benefits of farming in Duxbury. I think we can all agree that um, farmers don't get into the business to make a lot of money, and th therefore they don't have the resources. We all know how expensive real estate is. So they can't afford to buy farmland. And Duxbury has a unique opportunity here to provide farmers with the resources that they need. So some of the benefits are um, improved nutrition, and energy conservation, I think we all can all agree that a fresh picked strawberry tastes much better than a strawberry that was grown in California and shipped across the country. And then there's the, um, the, the um, educational aspects where farmers connect with children and schools to teach children where their food comes from and how it's grown. They also offer workshops and farm tours. And all this builds a sense of community where um, you know the farmer's name, you watch the crops grow, you can um, see the, the crops being harvested. And we also have the responsibility to connect aspiring farmers with experienced farmers so that we can have local farming for generations to come. Oops. So this is a map of the agricultural district. I won't spend a lot of time on this because Joe um, talked about the, the De Lorenzo's family. Um, their wish to have some of this land used as farmland. So as part of this project, we, um, we went to several towns. We went to Lincoln and Norwell and Middleborough. And what these towns have in common is that these are um, farms that the property is owned by the town. And they enter into long-term agreements with farmers. And we'd love to add Duxbury to this list. So what's next? Well, we'll put together a, um, a request for proposal. We'll review the proposals and then and pick some farmers. And I just want to say that farmers are environmentalists. They're stewards of the land. They need to be, pro to be productive, to have productive crops. They need to enrich the soil. And they do this through sustainable farming methods, <clears throat> pardon me, such as um, crop rotation and using natural fertilizers. And they, need, they also understand the importance of preserving open space and protecting the wildlife habitats. 
So in conclusion, I'd just like to say that um, though these are you know, some of the potential possibilities that we have building a farm on this property, but um, in closing, I'd just like to say that Kate attended an open space committee meeting and we had a very healthy, productive um, conversation, I think. And, um, and so the open space committee didn't you know, make this decision lightly. Um, we talk a lot about preserving trees and protecting our environment. And um, we voted unanimously not to approve the citizens' petition, and we ask you to vote no on this article to um, continue farming in Duxbury. Thank you. And I believe Ms. Morris will be the final speaker under the, the organized opposition. Then we'll open it up to the general public for questions. Ms. Morris. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, I'm Holly Morris, 145 Abrams Hill Road. <clears throat> I have served on the CONCOM for 15 years and on the CPC for 18 years. Um, and I've co-authored two open space plans, which is our master plan for open space and recreation, establishing goals and objectives and action plans. The 2017 open space plan was written by Pat Loring, Joe Grady, Valerie Massard, Kathy Cross, Graham Groombridge, and myself. Let me clearly state what's in the plan. In goals two and three, preservation of Duxbury's natural areas and environment and preservation of the unique character of our town specifically addresses the importance of preserving farmland. In the summary of community needs, the Duxbury Agricultural Commission drafted the Duxbury Right to Farm notification in 2008. The notification states, it is the policy of the community to conserve, protect, and encourage the maintenance and improvement of agricultural land for the production of food and other agricultural products and for its natural and ecological value. The Agricultural Commission promotes farming and the permanent protection of farmland and supports local farmers and provides invaluable support for the protection of both agricultural and non-agricultural open space. The Historical Commission also plays an important role in the protection of natural resources. In their effort to maintain the historic character of the town, they support the protection of agricultural land. In the 2018 town meeting presentation that was given by me, I stated that we had a number of land proposals. However, due to the constraints of our budget, we selected two properties that had the best conservation and agricultural values. One parcel was the Williams property and the other, which connected with the historic O'Neill farm and will extend the agricultural district is the De Lorenzo property. At the 2018 town meeting article, it states that this land is for open space, agricultural, water supply protection, and passive re recreation purposes. And to effectuate the foregoing acquisition to enter into management agreements for up to 10 years as may be necessary for the purposes of the article. At the 2000 annual town meeting presentation, I stated that we are fortunate to have acquired nearly 26 acres of land off of Summer Street that abuts the historic O'Neill Farm for the purpose of extending the agricultural district. And at the March 14, 2020 town meeting, the introduction that was given by me states that this property abuts the historic O'Neill Farm hayfield and has frontage on Route 53. Town meeting approved the acquisition of this land in 2018 for the expansion of the agricultural district. This money will be used for the installation of an irrigation well and clearing of approximately seven acres of land. Each year, the CPC goes before the Finance Committee, the Fiscal Advisory Committee, the Conservation Commission, and the Board of Selectmen. So we have been very public about all of our land acquisitions and the purposes. A no vote on Article 5 is a vote to support farming. The CPC and the Conservation voted no on this article. Thank you.
Thank you. Um, I'm going to recognize Selectman Guitart to speak, and the gentleman over here who's been waiting patiently, and then we'll start with the people in the back of the room. And unfortunately, I was, sorry, Fernando Guitart, uh, 14 Powder Point Avenue. Uh, unfortunately, I was not able to attend the meeting where my colleagues reviewed this article and made their vote. So I want to take this opportunity tonight to share with you my vote and the reasons why I'm voting. So I personally will vote no on this amended article for two reasons. Number one, from the start of the 2018 annual town meeting, and again in 2020, it has been clear that one of the uses of this conservation land we purchased was for agricultural use. And in addition, and most importantly, there have been numerous public meetings and site reviews, site visits to review, discuss, debate with all interested parties the scope and scale of this use. Number two, I will always support the work of our volunteer committees and commissions. These committees and commissions comprise volunteers, residents of this town, who give their time, energy, and commitment, as well as their expertise and experience to do their best for our town. I too care about conservation, the environment, and the protection of habitats. And I have confidence that our committee and commissions, community preservation, conservation, open space, open space and agriculture will do the right thing for our town. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, my name is Jeff Chandler. I'm the chair of the Agricultural Commission. Excuse me. I also live in Duxbury, 602 Lincoln Street. Um, the Agricultural Commission voted approximately two weeks ago, six to, not, six to zero, with one member not present, to not support this article also. Um, there's several reasons um, that you've heard a lot already. Um, one is, if we learn anything from COVID, we need to be less dependent on outside sources for our food. That was one we've had, uh, through the Agriculture Commission, we've had a lot of people this past year come to us come in looking for guidance as far as how they can grow vegetables and stuff in their own yard. They got chickens, they got multiple things going on. People are realizing that they need to be less dependent on outside sources for their food supply. This would be one step in that direction, one more step in that direction. Um, the land for any farmer is his bread and butter. They're not gonna do anything to that land to be a detriment to that, that land. That's, that's where the soil is, that's where, where you're growing, whether it's livestock, animals, plants, vegetables, it's, it's all dependent on the soil, the quality of soil. And maintaining that quality is, a, is utmost importance to any farmer in the country, in the world. <coughs> the, um, I'm gonna have to put my glasses on and read the rest of my notes. <laughs> As far as fertilizer goes, herbicides, pesticides, again, the farmer's only gonna put on the bare minimum of a fertilizer that he's gonna to need to grow that crop. Pesticides and herbicides, if there's, not, if there's no weeds, they're not gonna use any herbicides. It's not like your lawn care companies, they have a contract, they're gonna come once a month, and they're gonna spray, and they're gonna put down different things, whether there's a bug in the soil or not. If there's no bugs to be dealt with, that farmer's not gonna use a pesticide. Hence, it won't get into the soil, it won't, it won't have to be uh, half-life, we have to deal with that. The biggest threat to our groundwater, as far as the Agriculture Commission, we've been watching this for quite some time, is more residential. Again, it's your lawn care companies, it's, you, know, you go to Lowe's, you can buy 15,000 square feet of any kind of fertilizer with a herbicide in it, and they just, they just dump it on because they want a green lawn. As far as water, water usage, most of your farmers these days are using drip irrigation. They want water right at that plant, not spraying the hole, and then you're not, you're not supplying water to all the weeds, so you'll, hence that keeps the weed production down also. They use mulch, they use various other natural means to control the weeds, and again, it's an expense thing. The more you have to put into the production, the less, the less benefit you get out of it. Um, one of the other things that we've talked about is having field trips for the kids 
public schools, private schools, whatever it might be, to learn and see what the soil is about, get them back to the basics. How do they grow in their own vegetables? The Extension Service for years has been doing a call an embryology project, and they, they donate eggs to different schools. The kids get to watch them, treat them, warm them, keep them, and, and, and ultimately they hatch, and there's the chicken. And they just, then they get, they're welcome to take them home if, they, if the family can support the chicken. I mean, that's been going on for years. And this is something else we can use as far as, you know, teaching our kids coming up how to, how, how the, the world grows their vegetables and fruits and, and supports themselves. This is also going to create a lot of attraction for pollinators, beehives, butterflies, things like that. There are also a lot of grants available for startup farming right now that are available to some of these people that might be wanting to, to start a farm on this land. And also, the lastly, is the Agricultural Commission plans to work closely with the, with the Conservation Commission as far as selecting the farmers that will be on this project and what they're going to do and how they're going to do it and, and their background and what their, their qualifications are. Thank you. I'm going to recognize the woman to my left in the back. Um, and as we move forward, I realize people are passionate about this, but I guess I'd ask you to refrain from clapping. Uh, uh, Elizabeth Lewis, 62 Bravender Way. Um, and this is not a NIMBY. I am nearby, but it's well over 1,000 feet from my front step. So this is not NIMBY. And I'm very much pro-farm, and I'd love to see some farm in here. This motion is actually just asking us to pause the clear cutting until a plan can be developed. We just heard the plan is now to bring in children and school buses and a farm stand. What is the traffic impact of that on Route 53? What we'd like to see is a holistic town-wide approach to incorporating new farmland because I truly don't believe this is existing farmland. It's got 100-year-old trees. There have not been crops on it since 1930, and that was less than a quarter of an acre for a family garden. So as far as the misconception of existing farmland and what was happening with existing farmland and when we saw it, no, it's a little different. It's a, it's a forest. So just a few little points. This motion is just to ask them to pause the clear cutting until they provide a plan to the voters. We would like to see them look at other properties. We've got 60 acres of hay fields in town. Are those better to dig up than taking down trees to put farmlands in? Barry Brook has wonderful access, scenic vistas. O'Neill Farm isn't using all the hay that they grow right now because of the reduced amount of cattle on the property. Can we explore that? We just would like to see a plan. And as much as Open Space Committee says, we consider farmland in our open, open space plan. In 190 pages, there is not one goal that says provide new farmland. It's all protect existing farmland. Cutting down trees and digging it up is not um, existing farmland. When they mention that only 35% is going to be touched on this parcel, that 35% represents every possible square foot that they could dig up, except for the wetlands and the buffers and the vernal pools. So it's not like, well, we're only using a portion of what we could use, because really they are digging up just about the entire property that could be touched. And there are some concerns, because the Duxbury regulations do suggest a 100-foot no-touch zone for vernal pools. And the Conservation Commission, and by state guidelines, went with a 25-foot buffer. So again, we're just asking for some, some step back and do a plan that we can all gather around and agree upon. The other towns that were noted, Lincoln, Norwell, Middleborough, those are all farms that were in continuous operation for some, in some cases, 150 years. And in one of the cases, it's actually a nonprofit that owns the land and not the town. So we're for it, but can we just take a pause, not clear the trees till we really understand where we're going with this goal of farming in the town? Thank you. Thank you.
gentleman in the back. Hi, Colleen Breyer, Toby Garden Street. I just had a couple of questions. Um, since the, um, I guess the uh, regulation is 100 foot setback, I'm wondering why we went with the 25, if someone could speak to that, please. Uh, you get a little bit of wetlands uh, science here. Yeah. Um, the Conservation Commission's jurisdiction extends 100 feet from most wetlands. So the edge of the wetland is shown on the plan there. And if any work's proposed within 100 feet, you need a permission from the, the Conservation Commission to do work there. That's the regulatory uh, area. So, so you feel that 25 feet, we won't be disturbing the vernal pool, is what you're saying? That's correct. The okay. Conservation Commission allows uh, driveways, lawns, uh, all within 25 feet of wetlands in Duxbury. And believe it or not, that's actually considered to be um, pretty strict. In, in the state of Massachusetts, you can build right up to the, the very edge within you know, one foot of a wetland. Okay, and, it, and it's hard to tell the scale, um, but if the real concern was protecting those vernal pools, how much farmland would you actually lose if you tried to, to buffer them more? I mean, looking at that, it looks, oh, if you made a, a I guess, a wildlife path to the rest of the woods, it seems like one of the concerns. How much farmland would you be using, losing um, to, to do that? I, I don't have the acreage. Um, the Conservation Commission used their expertise to permit this plan that's shown no. that is seven acres of additional clearing okay. and feels that the wetlands will be still protected on that site. Okay. These and I are guess the, the people that do it every two weeks that have been sitting on the board for over 80 years. <laughs> I've spent 40 years, my entire career, protecting wetlands and the I environment in Duxbury. Joe. And there isn't a bone in my body that would hurt a vernal pool on the De Lorenzo site. Excellent. I am putting my reputation on this project. Excellent. Um, and one other question, there was concern about costs of cutting the trees down. Is there going to be a cost? And what would the payback be? I mean, the... Yeah, this isn't a budget that's just uh, made up. I actually yeah. had to come to these committees, and it's $63,000. It's, uh, it's actually been reduced because um, Kate asked for an additional uh, buffer behind her house, so we reduced the area to be cleared by an acre, so a half an acre rather. So instead of seven and a half acres, we're, we're only uh, going to be clearing seven acres. And uh, the total cost of the irrigation, trash removal, and the land clearing is $63,000. And the payback based on the leases, how, how many years would that take to recover the costs? We don't expect to recover any of that. The town, in, in, in its leasing of farmland, um, it's, it's not a money making, it's okay. really just a legal agreement. Okay. Um, we need to be able to make this land available to farmers so that we can still have farming in Duxbury. Yes. The land is far too valuable and it turns into house lots if the Conservation Commission doesn't buy it. Yes, and I can tell you, uh, it's, houses are going up everywhere and a lot of the woodlands are or I said open in spaces Massachusetts, disappearing, in, so. In eastern Massachusetts, there'll be no farming unless yeah. municipal property and state property is allowed to be uh, given to local farmers to farm. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's the only way we'll still see farming in Massachusetts, in eastern Massachusetts. Yeah. Thank you, Joe. I'll recognize the woman up here to my left and then you, Mr. Lampert. Hi, uh, Eve Penoyer, 59 Tussock Brook Road. Um, can someone speak to the composition of the forest that is currently planned to be cleared, the seven acres? Um, is it hardwoods, pines, a mix? What's the approximate mix, percentage-wise? Well, I don't have percentages, but I can say that the area over near Bravender Road is a white pine forest, extremely dense. Uh, there's a lot of dead wood there because if you know how 
Um, seedlings from white pine uh, colonize. They get extremely dense. They grow up and they, it's like a dead stand of trees. Um, there's also a lot of bitter, bittersweet covering the trees over towards some of the vernal pools near the new development that's shown on this plan. And the, the trees are absolutely covered and being smothered by it. And then as you get over towards the meadows of the historic O'Neill farm, there are uh, you know, full-size oak trees in that particular area. We tried to, we used a land surveyor to prepare this plan and he overlaid the soils map that was prepared by the natural resource folks. They actually go out and they dig holes in the ground and determine where the good soils are. And we focused our clearing in those particular areas. This was a farm, it has rich farmland soils, and those, that, that's what this plan depicts. Just a follow-up question uh, related to your soil testing that you, that you mentioned. It, it just seems to me that it's a rather disjointed farm in terms of the size of the pieces and, and the arrangement. Um, if you look up in um, the two upper vernal pools to the right of that, or I guess east of that, um, you've got a large forest area. And why wa was the soil testing not um, uh, satisfactory there? And that's why that's not being cleared? Because uh, it seemed to me that you would get an, yeah, <laughs> a, neater, a neater shaped farm if you kind of left the vernal pool area wooded and then cleared mm -hmm that in-between area up there to the sort of... The entire area was surveyed for its soils, and this map depicts the area to be cleared is where the prime important farmland soils were. There was a lot of study that went into this, contrary to what's being said. We've, we've been working on this for several years with people in the industry. Mr. Lampert. James Lampert, 148 Washington Street. I'm both a little confused and frankly a little disappointed by some of the discussion tonight. It seems clear that this potentially could be very good farmland. I think it also is clear that throughout the 35 years or so I've been in town, we've been very protective of forest. And there's clearly a balance between the two. I think Elizabeth Lewis and a couple of others have drawn an important distinction between preserving the land that we have as farmland and destroying forest to create more farmland. What I would have hoped to hear tonight was a discussion of what this particular piece of property, if converted by clearing somewhere around seven to 10 acres, is going to add to the agricultural opportunities, educational and otherwise, that we already have in town. And not simply that, oh, everybody has known this always might be agricultural. I'm not wild about the uh, phrasing of this article, frankly, in many ways, but I think that its basic thrust and I hope to hear it tonight, was let's hear a discussion of the what are the benefits, financial and otherwise to the town, of turning forest into farmland, given the fact that we already have substantial farmland, and frankly we already have, and we spend a lot of money having substantial forest. That's what I would have hoped to hear tonight, and I'm disappointed that I did not. If I may, Ann, Ann Ward, 28 Huckleberry Lane. Um, I have a question about the actual farming, the type of farming. Uh, are there any limitations on what crops could be grown on this property? And I'm particularly interested because of the proximity to the Tar Kiln Recreational Facilities and the Chandler School, if this land could be used for farming marijuana. And additionally, could indoor growing facilities be built on this land and be counted as farming? Um, so if you could answer that question. I know we, a couple of years ago, we passed an overlay district um, regarding uh, the farming of marijuana. So I don't know if you have a slide that shows that overlay district or not, but that would be very helpful. Thank you. 
Does, does somebody have an answer? Oh, I, I'm sorry. It's very hard to hear up here. You, you wanted to know if they were going to be growing marijuana on the site? Is that... I... Not for my personal use, but... Um, <laughs> <laughs> because of the proximity to the Tar Kiln Recreation Facilities and the Chandler Elementary School, I'm curious to see... Uh, an, a diagram of the overlay district that the that we voted on several years ago at town meeting that um, provides for restrictions for where cannabis can be grown within the town of Duxbury. Okay, I don't have that overlay, but I can tell you that we won't be growing marijuana on that property. We're going to be growing conventional crops so that people can come down there and either pick their own strawberries or they can buy asparagus that grows there. Um, the communities that we visited have uh, really enjoyed things such as community supported agriculture. That's where um, residents go in the spring and they buy shares. And the shares are about $40 a week. And if for that, the farmer will provide whatever is of season for instance, lettuce early in the season, maybe radishes, things like that. And each week, families come and pick up a whole box of products that are available that are, are ripe for that season. And as the season moves along, it might be corn and broccoli and spinach and on and on. And they have an entire season that they pay for up front. And that money goes to the farmer in March so that he can buy the seed and everything that's necessary. And the communities that have these CSAs the waiting list is enormous. It is an incredibly popular item. It, it draws the community to these farms. And I can only tell you that this is the type of thing that we're trying to bring to this property. This is the vision that we have. And the Ag Commission and other members of these volunteer committees will be putting together of, of what they're looking for, and they'll be soliciting proposals from farmers. We've had farmers visit the site. They can't wait to bid on the land. There's a huge need for this, for farmers to find land, rich farmland, and we think this is going to be a wonderful resource for the community where you can come and you can buy your own vegetables. We don't need to go to Cretnons in Kingston. We'll be able to go to Zero Summer Street and buy vegetables here in Duxbury. Thank you. Mrs. Well, I need somebody to make that motion from from a uh, speak from a microphone. Mrs. Sullivan's been waiting patiently. I'll recognize you, and then and then in the back. And if somebody wants to make that motion, I'll entertain that as well. I, I will be brief. Um, I um, was equal parts horrified and and happy that I've been coming to these meetings for 30 years. And uh, during that time, I have never demonstrated the fact that I trust blindly. I always um, am one that looks to make sure that I trust the person that's making their presentation, that I believe in what they're saying to be true. Um, over the course of that time, uh, Joe and Holly and members of the uh, conservation Mr. Chandler has been a longtime member of our agricultural community as well as uh, our fire department. These are people that I have learned over the course of 30 years to trust. Their credentials prove them to be knowledgeable in their area. I didn't know what a vernal pool was until Joe taught me. Um, and I would um, hesitate to say that I have not seen any credentials from the proponents of this, of this article. Um, everything that um, has been told to us tonight was information that was willingly given by these people, and they have also invited the petitioners to take part in the future planning of this site. Um, I believe that this is something, we are 60% conservation land in town, which is a good thing, a really, really good thing. Unfortunately, a lot of that land is not accessed by the community. 
We know it's there, we benefit by its existence, our environment benefits from this existence, but we do not participate in that land. This is an opportunity and has been from the beginning that the community can actively participate in a tangible way with what they're investing in. And to even consider the fact that these people would not have the protection of our environment, the protection of our water, the protection of anything that they have fought their entire adult lives to protect is very difficult for me to, with my cute little Irish temper, manage. Um, I, I have to say that comparing, I don't know whether it was town hall or these people to the mafia was a little rough. Um, I'm really not, not clear. I think that you have to trust the people that have made this town look the way it does. And if you need any proof that they haven't been doing their job, just get on 53, 3A, or any of the other, and go to any of our surrounding towns, and then you will know for a fact that they have been. So I would, um, and this is me personally, this is not the Finance Committee, I would urge you to vote no on this article. And I would hope that the petitioners do participate in the, in the planning of what is going to go there because it is a vested interest, it is their neighborhood, it is adjacent to their land. So, um, you know, we voted it five years ago, we talked about it for five years, and, you know, I trust these people, and I, uh, I hope you do too. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> gentlemen, gentlemen in the back. Yes, hi, my name is Carol Smith, I live at 415 North Street. And um, I have some concerns uh, about, I'm, I'm all for farms myself and grew up with an acre of vegetable gardens that I uh, had to weed and, and do all that. And we just put in um, some um, gardens ourselves during COVID and I'm all for being self-sufficient. But I feel like this is kind of a setup between um, if we wanna protect our farmlands or we wanna protect our wetlands and our vernal pools, both of which are important. And I do find it, I understand there is very rich soil that is, um, the soil analysis shows this will be amazing for, um, for, gar for farming. And, but I just find it hard to believe that we're preserving farmland that had turkeys on it 50 years ago but hasn't had crops at the expense of coming within 25 feet of the vernal pools when we just said regulations are 100 feet on six of those six lower vernal pools, and in fact, best practice is three to 400 feet. I'm all for protecting the vernal uh, pools and the wetlands and the wildlife that go with that, at the same time as balancing with farms. So I, I support perhaps um, putting a pause to clearing 10 acres of, of the wetlands, and then you have to wait another 50, 60 years for it to reforest, and perhaps you know look at this again, or look at the need for farming. Are there other soils, as was mentioned, on other farms? Um, the the O'Neill farm, or the Isaac Simmons farm, that, or the other ones that we own collectively. Um, and I, I lastly had a question. I understand that the intent, even when it was purchased, was to have agricultural use here. Um, is, so the intent then is to clear, clear, you know, open the land and then just have um, renting uh, towards farmers. I, I wish there were like a, a more clear cut um, plan in place. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Wild, I'm gonna recognize the gentleman who's been Waiting patiently, and then I'll get to you. Hi, uh, Sam Butcher, Meeting House Road. I'm a member of the Conservation Commission and also am involved in the historical Neil Farm. Uh, Mr. Lambert, if you're interested, I'd be more than happy to talk to you about uh, some significant synergies that we see with the historical Neil Farm and uh, this proposal in front of you. But my question is really uh, a technical one, and that is, it's unclear to me whether the article is to get a sense of the meeting is of what we might do going forward or whether it is gonna set up a precedent for decisions that we've made through numerous boards to be revisited um, when a group of people in the, in the uh, a group of residents um, feels that they have, that it, 
that they don't want it. Um, and so I guess my question is quite simply, is this a, are, are, is the Conservation Commission, because it's all about me, um, is the Conservation Commission going to have to go back and look at everything that we've done and reopen this hearing? Or is this really to uh, help give us a sense going forward of what we should be looking at? Well, the, the motion that's being made is a request, not, a, not an instruction. And so you're being, if this passes, the request of this meeting would be, a sort of a sense of the meeting, that you go back and revisit it. I think is a fair, a fair summary of what's going on. Thank you. Mr. Weiler. I'd like to move the previous question. <laughs> so we have a request to move the question. What that means, it's non-debatable. Um, and what it means is if you vote yes, uh, we will stop talking about it and we'll ask you for a yes or no on this. And if you vote no, we will continue to talk about it and answer your questions. Um, it is a two-thirds vote to, 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 um, to pass. Are there any questions about what the motion means? Not reasons for it, but, but on the motion itself. Hearing none, I'm going to ask for a vote. It's a two-thirds vote. All those in favor of, of stopping discussion and voting, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed? Nay. Motion, I, I declare a two-thirds vote with minimal, minimal um, opposition. Um, we're now down to the original main motion, uh, which you may remember um, is to request that the Town Conservation Commission not move forward. Um, does anybody want the motion reread? Mrs. Sullivan, could you please reread the motion? It's been, to read, the motion read the motion again. Oops, it's been so, some time, and I think. Sorry, that I, I put it away. Wait, hold on. Give me a second. Got it right here. Mrs. Sullivan. There you go. Revised, nope, right? that's it. I need the revised one. You, come, you have the revised one. I don't have it. Behind you, behind you, Brent. Oh, got it. Thank you. Go. Sorry. I packed up, sorry about that. To see if the town will vote to request that the Town Conservation Commission not move forward with plans to clear or alter the land through removal of trees or vegetation located at Zero Summer Street containing 27.32 acre and show shown on a map of land on file at the office of the town clerk owned by the town of Duxbury Conservation Commission and identified by assessor's reference 031 dash 502 dash 047 until such a time when further study can be done. Everybody get that? Do you want me to read it again? No, please. Okay. Okay. Uh, it's time for a vote. All those in favor of that motion, please say yes. yes. All opposed? No. Um, I declare that the noes have it. Motion fails. So we we got we got through it in one night. Thank you very much. And so that completes the business of this special town meeting. I'll entertain a motion to adjourn this special town meeting. Sonny Dye. So moved. Second. Motion has been moved and seconded. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed, the ayes have it. <laughs>